Good day, everyone. Okay, so this is chapter two, lecture one of psychology. And I thought I would try something different with this chapter because I got a lot of pictures and I wanna be able to sort of draw your attention to certain parts of the picture. So um, if this is really problematic for you and, and it's just too obnoxious, by all means, email me, message me, and uh, we'll do something different. But, and your feedback is very welcome, very much invited. Okay, so in this lecture, I think I'm gonna have time to just introduce these, this topic and this chapter. And um, there's a lot of material here and I'm not gonna get into great detail, but just I think I'll start by giving you a broad stroke. This is one of my very favorite pictures that I've accumulated over the years of teaching this. Um, so I, I would, if we were together, I would ask you like, do you know what is the back or the front? Um, and why is some of this a lighter color and some of this a darker color? So this up here would be your forehead, right? And this is the back. So this is your frontal lobe up here, down at the bottom of the screen. And in the back here is your occipital lobe. And your occipital lobe, the back of the head, this is where your visual cortex is. So one of the quiz questions and an exam question is why do you see black spots when you hit the back of your head? And that's because you are um, you're not damaging, but you're, yeah, you're injuring your occipital lobe. Um, you might also notice that there's a small sort of space in between the brain tissue and your skull, and that is filled with fluid, and this is intended to serve as a cushion. And the next picture where I talk about concussions, um, that's, that, that's the part of the cushion is that is so your brain doesn't, you know, get smacked around and bruised by the side of your, cult, your skull. The whitey stuff in here, um, this is also a really important question, and it is white because it is covered with myelin, myelin sheath, which is fat, fatty tissue. Um, and then you'll notice here these little grooves, uh, what's another word for it? Grooves, pits and valleys, grooves and valleys, these folds in your brain. Um, and these are, I think this is another quiz question, is why is your brain got all these folds? And that is effectively to increase surface area so that there's more, um, so that there are more messages or more information. Um, sometimes I'll have military people in my classroom and in the military they teach you to roll your clothes instead of fold your clothes. That's because you can get more in a smaller space and that's effectively your brains are organized. Here's a little fun fact though, is that each one of these divots, each one of these folds, they all actually have a name. Like all of our brains are supposed to have the same folds in them. Um, but yeah, they each, they all individually have a name. Um, and the next slide here, uh, it's too bad you to see my notes, my note version here. I stuck this one in a few years ago, um, actually as a, out of a personal interest, but this is, these are to illustrate a concussion. And my daughter, who was a cheerleader, got a concussion, and I honestly didn't know that much about it. So I went out and did a, I did a little bit of um, learning about concussions. And I just want to say, the mother in me, I want to tell you to take concussions seriously. They are serious, right? Concussions are basically brain bruises. That it's where you're whacking your head around enough that the, the, the fluid, the cushion between your brain and your skull, and your brain comes smack up against that bone, and it causes a, a bruise. If you've ever had a really, really deep bruise in say your leg or your arm, it takes several days before it starts to turn yellow. That's what concussions are. And then when you, the reason that if you're in like high school sports or something and they say, you know, to sit out for a little while is because you don't want to re-injure that. Uh, you don't want to re-injure that bruise. And it can take months, months for a concussion to heal. The only thing, that heals a concussion is sleep. Reading, watching television, talking, all of that uses cognitive neurological resources. Um, and the only thing now you sometimes you hear is that you're not supposed to go to sleep. If you do a little reading up on why that is, the reason you're not supposed to go to sleep is because um, it's about Seeing, uh, getting a sense of how severe the concussion is to make sure you don't start bleeding from your nose or your ears or you don't uh, black out. But once you've been sort of evaluated by a doctor that you're not gonna 
you didn't have severe brain damage, sleep is the only thing that can heal your brain. Um, might make you, might impair your memory. Oh gosh, your concentration uh, might be hard to read. You certainly don't want to read. You certainly don't want to be on the computer. Um, take concussions seriously. Uh, those are brain bruises. Okay, so this chapter is, like I say, there's a lot uh, to discuss in the context of the central nervous, of the nervous system. Um, this is not in any uh, particular order, uh, but we will cover, um, we'll cover the neuron, the structures of the neuron, otherwise known as brain cell. The central, and there are neurons all over your body and actually all throughout your system. Some neurons can be as long as four feet and run the whole length of your spinal cord. Your central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord, that's most typically what we think of when we think of our nervous system. Your peripheral, which is a fun word to say, peripheral nervous system. And this is like your periphery. It's on the outside, right? It's not the central, so it's in the periphery of your nervous system. This one is broken down into your autonomic, otherwise known as your automatic. You can think of it. I, for me, I have to think about um, other ways what words look like and what words are similar to in order to keep them straight. So I keep this one straight as automatic, right? Even though that's not the word, it's autonomic. This autonomic system has two subsystems. We have one referred to as your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic. Um, the way I remember and the way I talk about your sympathetic nervous system is this is um, the system that feels sorry for you. This is your fight or flight system, right? Your sympathetic nervous system is the one that when you are in danger, it reacts very quickly because it has sympathy for you and it's about your survival. So this is your stress response, your fear response, your fight or flight response. The parasympathetic, para meaning like, it's like your sympathetic, except it does the opposite. Your parasympathetic system is the one, is, it's, I've heard it described as your rest and digest system. This is the system that slows things down. Whereas your sympathetic system moves very quickly, your parasympathetic system moves very slowly. Your parasympathetic system is the one that is about you engage in the process of meditation or mindfulness or deep breathing. It's so, I don't know if you've ever, if you've taken a speech class, but this is how I always think of them, is you're getting ready to take a, you're getting ready to give a speech and you're, uh, and, and the guy, the person going before you and you're getting increasingly nervous and increasingly aroused, your heart rate starts to increase. Maybe it gets so loud you can hear your heart rate in your ears when you can hear your heartbeat in your ears, right? You give your speech and you sit back down and you, you can't remember, you, don't, you, don't pay, you can't pay any attention to the person that goes after you. Maybe two speeches later, now you have calmed back down, right? Your sympathetic system kicked in quite quickly to protect you and it took a lot longer for your parasympathetic system to calm you down. Also part, of the, also part of the nervous system is your endocrine system. Sometimes I'll ask students, you know, what is, what's the endocrine system? What does endocrine mean? This is your hormone system. Um, or as my other husband likes to say, her whores are moaning. <laughs> anyway, your hormone system, your, your endocrine system. Uh, and this is interesting because some of the molecules, some of the molecules, some of the chemicals engaged in your endocrine system are in your blood and they might also be found in your brain as, neuro, as um, neurotransmitters. So point is, is that your endocrine system is a complicated system that regulates. And so it's a slower process. Um, it's a slower system where you have a little, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, gland, right? A, the, your penile gland. And it tells other glands and other parts of your body, hey, you need to send out this messenger. And then it sends out this, those messengers to other glands. Um, so, but anyway, it's, this is considered part of your nervous system. I am at almost 10 minutes, so I'm going to stop here, if I can only figure out how to do that. And in the next one, I will pick up talking about some of the other brain structures.